Yes! What is up, everybody? And what a stream we have for you today on the Power Hour. And then tomorrow, just as a teaser, we are doing a watch-along, all right, for the Manchester City Arsenal game. I already think City's going to blow them away, but you never know what Mikel Arteta has in his... Or what he's hiding under his hair helmet. You know what I mean? You just don't know. And then on Friday, we're going to have the power hour. And then right after it's over, we are going to watch Spurs versus Manchester United, which will include my new favorite person on planet Earth, Marcus Rashford. The guy is an absolute hero. And I have some newfound respect and love for this man. But it doesn't eclipse the love that I have for our special guest, a man who was my teammate on the U.S. men's national team. He was my nemesis at the club level, but I still love them anyway. A lot of respect and admiration for his game. And then he's a role model for me uh, in the media scene because after he retired, he got into it. Uh, he's been in TV forever. Now he's a, he is the, I would say, the most consistent American voice on NBC Sports' coverage of the Premier League, which I feel like it's got to be a tough gig, man, because they just don't rate Americans. Uh, if you don't have the right accent, then you just don't get the respect. Anyway, it's Kyle Martino. Kyle, what is up, man? Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I got to fix your little side. You're a little, you're a little smaller than I want you to be, and you're not that small. <laughs> so I'm going to bring you up right now. What's up, dude? How are you? Yeah. By the way, watch out with the hair helmet comments because I'm in the hair helmet union. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, look at that head of hair. It's unbelievable. So, oh. so, so. And actually, I have this side behind me that says best hair in the game. And, and I'm just trying to leave it out there, whether it's that's for you or whether it's for me. I don't know. Up for, up for debate. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> okay. So, so how excited are you for the Premier League to be back? Oh, uh, I mean, so so I, I haven't been this excited to get back in the studio since, since that first season where um, the anticipation of not really knowing what it was going to be like and – you know, starting something new, starting something fresh. This kind of feels like a, like a reboot in many ways. And like over the years, I've grown to love Rebecca and the Robbie's like family. So seeing them again um, is going to be amazing. But when you distill everything down to its essence, I just, I love this game so much and I'm sad when I'm not able to watch it. No, I feel the same way. And, and I'm excited that it's back. Obviously the Bundesliga is, got back and really got things started. Now La Liga is starting to kick in. What do you think the Premier League can learn from those leagues to maybe enhance the experience? You know, because we've seen the piped in noise. You know, we're, we're I, I assume you guys have some tricks uh, <laughs> that, are, that are coming up with regards to how you're going to broadcast the games. Or maybe maybe you're not. Or maybe you don't want to reveal the secrets. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, uh, no, no real, no real tricks. I, I'm, I'm thinking of Job in uh, Arrested Development right now. <laughs> no. Coming up with something amazing. Um, but, the, uh, you know, it's cool. You know, the Bundesliga did every league, forget, forget you know, our game, any professional sports league that want to start back up, so hard to be the first. So the Bundesliga and their, you know, their television partners have done a great job just launching a successful but very difficult, um, you know, restart. And... I, I know that we I could I, I could speak for you on this. Like there's a lot of scary stuff going on right now. And, um, you know, we we can have two truths at the same time. I think we can for sure be incredibly compassionate and um, and supportive of those truly being affected by this crazy uh, pandemic that's been going on. Um, and then also be incredibly supportive and continue to find ways that we can educate ourselves or use our pulpits to speak for uh, a more equitable world and get behind this incredible social justice movement, Black Lives Matter. So in that like really powder keg charged and important cultural moment, you can also say, man, I'm so excited sport is going to be back. And then also you, you can conflate the two. I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit, but like Sport is a social justice vehicle. I know you've probably gotten the same. Like, I've always used my platforms and chose to speak about a lot of these issues and would get the stick to sports, Kyle, kick a ball. We don't want to hear any of this. <laughs> it's kind of amazing to see out of the gate, you know, Sancho and some of these Bundesliga players and then some of the Premier League teams, you know, say, forget it. We are coming back and we can we can come back and celebrate just the beauty of the game, but also understand the incredible powers it has culturally. You know, it's funny that you say that the stick to sports thing, stay in your lane type thing. I mean, 
who's the person that's saying to me? And what do they do? Because I'd be like, well, why don't you stick to being a manager at a grocery store? Okay. Just, just stick to managing <laughs> groceries. Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't need you to tell me how to, how to run my life. You know, that always cracks me this up. Is Carl CPA. Okay. <laughs> just do my taxes. I don't exactly. want to hear what you care about. When it, yeah. You're not good. a human being. I don't care. You're not a full body 3d person. You're just one person and you only have one thing that you care about. And that's CPA taxes. That always cracks me up. All right. Now there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of comments. Uh, we're going to get to all the stuff. Kyle's picks and my picks for top four, bottom three, uh, Europa League, all that type of stuff. We have some awards coming as well. I should have said that from the very beginning. Our best manager of the year, player of the year, because we already know Liverpool is going to win the league. So we'll get into that and, and we'll see uh, what Kyle has to say with regard to all those things. But before we get into that, though, and I'll get to some comments as well. Uh, let's talk about Marcus Rashford. Because he uh, is doing some big things. In particular, he put a lot of pressure on the UK government to basically they talk the talk. You know, they do all the Black Lives Matter. They say all the right things. But now he's forcing them to walk the walk as he should. They should be doing this anyway. But a credit to him for really putting the pressure on and, and getting more money to try to end child poverty. What can you say about this man in particular and what he's done? I mean, uh, uh, Honestly, it's so inspiring and incredible. You know what what he's done from a young age, and and many other players, um, simply on the field is something to marvel at, right? To take the incredible challenge of being a Manchester United player, a young Manchester United player, a young Manchester United player that needs to score goals, a young Manchester United player that needs to score b- goals and is black, and all of the difficult situations, and I think of Ryan Sterling and others who have um, taken on the remarkable challenge of being a professional athlete in the modern day that's hard enough and and using that platform and using his profile to try and bring change. And I think of uh, the Common Goal Project and, and Juan Mata and many other athletes that have um, – tried to commit their salary to, to, uh, you know, change and, and, and social, um, issues, but, but to get, to get a government who told him to stick to sports initially to, to change legislation, you know, to, to recognize that you have something important to say, you know, with all the things going on in his world, you'd forgive him for maybe being a bit selfish or having tunnel vision to getting back on the field. You know, he's coming back from injury and all these other things to to have the humility and have the the size of heart and also the bandwidth to take on an issue like this and succeed. It's like, holy cow, man. I mean, so impressive. I think what's interesting is that you see pushback to his his voice in some ways. I don't know how anybody could push back on the fact that we need to feed hungry kids. Like, it just blows my mind that anybody outside of a troll who's just looking for Marcus Rashford's attention, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's beyond me sometimes that this is divisive. And now I feel like when he goes back onto the field, he's going to hear it from some people when he's just trying to do the right thing. That, that's, for me, beyond politics, beyond picking a side. It's just about we've got a lot of hungry kids in this country. What can we do to serve them better? That's, that's what the focus should be. And then I guess the second step, and I hope that he continues, and I'm sure that he will. Why are we in that situation in the in the first place? How did we get there? You know, those are the 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 next steps uh, to I think eradicating a lot of these issues. Of course, this could be a generational thing, for sure. Yeah, I mean, so brave, man. And also, like, I think of Kaepernick now in this moment, and and I think of many athletes through many decades. You know. I think the the they've paved the path and paved the way for it not being as hard, even as difficult as it is for Rashford to do it, um, or Raheem Sterling to stand up and say what he said after multiple times face, facing uh, racism within within the game and outside of the white line. So it's um, it's just great that linear story. Um, you know, it's 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 the arc of social justice, right? It, it, you know. It's it's or, or the you know the arc of the moral universe is long but bends towards social social justice. Like a lot of these guys are a part of that fabric of continuing to move it forward. And it's just incredible. Like I feel we're in a different place now, where this wouldn't have been possible for Rashford to even be considered or that even be newsworthy, let alone successful. So it's kind of an exciting times, but also you know really scary times with with what's going on. Yeah, I want to give a shout out again to Marcus Rashford. Uh, unbelievable, and I'm I'm 
I, we're going to continue to sing his praises, uh, whether it's on social media or here on the stream. And I really look forward to seeing how he plays. I think, I hope that it elevates his performance, but not that it matters. He feels like, yeah, and he, I, hope and he's he's back. I hope he's back. Oh, I hope he's, and I hope he bangs a couple goals in on Spurs too. I think that would be pretty sweet. Maybe not for your Spurs fans or if you're Jose Mourinho. Now there is uh, just to pivot a little bit. There's a, a nice comment from flats who says, uh, why does Kyle Martino look like the sexy janitor that buy you beer with that earring? <laughs> <laughs> which is amazing then there's another one uh t toller says martino earring game is on point uh yeah what's what's going on you you've, you're bringing the, the earring back huh well you so it's so funny i you um you know we've been in camps together you know me i think were we at the confederations cup t- together were we ever at an international tournament together no I know I, we only in- did we did some january camps I know we were in moments where we combined rooms so that we could get, um, you know, a player halo going, but like, <laughs> I don't do well with idle time. And so, you know, it's been really challenging to, to be locked inside. So I've, I got, I've gotten creative with a few, with a few, um, personal aesthetic decisions. This one was a throwback. I just wanted to see if I still had the earrings that, uh, I, I had a friend uh, Pierce at a party in high school and, uh, yeah, the holes are still there. <laughs> Sweet. Well, as long as you're buying beer for all of us afterwards, I think we're all good. <laughs> all right. Well, on that, that that theme of lightheartedness, the Premier League is now saying that they're going to have subs come onto the field to music, which is very baseball-esque. Now, I don't know, what how you feel about it, but then my second question, the follow-up would be, what music would you choose? And I almost want to be a sub myself. I think it would almost be cooler to come on <laughs> with some music than it would be to start the game and not have any music at all. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to first answer your question with a question. What song would Troy Dyack come on to? Dude, uh, I, the yeah. best, dude best Dyack story ever. We were playing um, at uh, Spartan Stadium, and he got a red card. And remember the way to get onto the field was that ramp in, like, the back corner? Right. So, like, he, he got a red card, took his shirt off, was, like, <laughs> spinning it around his head, flexing, and ran up the ramp like a reverse WWE. <laughs> like, and it was one of the best soccer moments of all time. So I think um, and sure, I, listen, my dad has this saying, if you can't fix it, feature it. it it's going to be weird to have games, and you and I both know, like we've played in these closed environment games. Like It sucks for players, and it sucks for fans. It's not as much fun to, to be an environment without the fans. There would be no game. There would be no sport. We wouldn't have done what we did to our bodies over the years without um, the incredible drive and spirit and, and environment that fans bring to the game. So all these creative ways of piping in sound, um, I think they should pipe in the, the fan and, and crowd noise in the PA system for the players. You know, kind of like Pavlov's dog, I think you'd, you'd actually see a response and the players would enjoy that. But I'm, I'm down for anything that isn't super gimmicky to just say, like, these are weird times. Like, let's just try stuff. Sometimes we just take it way too seriously, you know? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just a bunch of players in small shorts kicking a ball in a certain direction, you know? And Some smaller than others, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So so uh, what would your song be? You still didn't answer that part of my question. Um. So I, I'll say it because um, it's just a, a remarkable humble brag. Um, when I when I won Rookie of the Year, um, yes, God, I'm 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 blanking on his name. He was working in digital. Um, he's Asbury Park um, now. Oh, um, Sean Francis. Yeah, yeah. Sean Francis yeah. did the editing for the for the gala, and I when I won Rookie of the Year, he did Baby You're a Star by Prince. <laughs> oh, I mean, dude, I would definitely come up. What a hero. Yeah, I would do uh, Mr. Big Stuff. Who do you That's think good. you are? Mr. Big Stuff. Yeah, it pretty much sums it would me be up. Oh, you walked out to that, though. That's everything. Yeah, yeah. And there's got a, there's a certain strut, I think, that goes to that song as well. You can't just, like, sprint into your spot and, like, on a, on a second. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Mr. Fix. Yeah, you got to ease your way in there. There's a strut. There's a strut for sure. All right, now as a Newcastle supporter, and I know you can see my jersey. It's it's it sucks to be a Newcastle supporter more often than not. Uh, I did want to get your thoughts on the on the potential takeover, because obviously I'm not a fan of any owners that have human rights violations on their hands, um, and I don't know what they're going to do with that. 
if they're going to remove those owners and try to do something else. On the flip side, though, as a fan, I would love that in flush of cash so that we could go buy Ronaldo and Messi and actually get Pochettino in charge and we could go on and win all the leagues and trophies available. What? Exactly. <laughs> that's how it's all going to happen. Well, that's how it plays out in my head. Uh, what, what are you hearing, I guess, about this takeover? And I, because I just wanted to end like this speculation. I just want to, I guess, have to accept that Mike Ashley is going to continue to be my owner that doesn't care uh, and do the bare minimum uh, and, and, you know, maybe punch some horses along the way. I don't know, whatever he likes to do. But I, 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 I kind of wanted to know what your thoughts were on Newcastle. Um, well, it's really, I, I share your sentiment of, and the vetting will be thorough for obvious reasons. Premier League is a very big brand. Um, so like most sports leagues, of course, it's, it's, um, it's important to vet the owners. What do they stand for? What's their track record? What's their history? I mean, I think some could make arguments that owners have been let in in the past um, that, that probably wouldn't pass that, that vetting process, but it's today and it's Newcastle and it looks like, you know, there's, there's, there's always more updates. You know, they keep kind of finding new things that make them um, unattractive and unacceptable as an ownership group. You know, it's, it's, I feel for Newcastle fans, you just can't get rid of Mike Ashley. It's like the little <laughs> hurts. interview with the vampire when she cut it and it, like, grows back. I mean, like, this is the worst, like, would you rather ever? Like, would you rather keep Mike Ashley as an owner or welcome in an ownership group with remarkable human, you know, rights violations? It's like, oh. Uh. So, yeah, I mean, you're probably going to be, from what I know, and I know little, I'm on the outside, I'm like anyone else just reading what you guys you know, what they write, what they find, it, it doesn't seem likely this ownership group ends up taking over Newcastle. What hurts, I think, as a fan of, and I guess we could maybe enter into this conversation, it's a much longer one, but but what hurts to be a fan of, a, in the promotion relegation, um, I guess, perspective, is that I have a club that we're basically hoping for mid-table purgatory. Like, we just don't want to get relegated. Uh, we actually, I don't even know if we want to get into Europe, because in that, that, really thins us out to actually compete in the league. We'll most likely get relegated uh, because we just don't have the the depth to, to manage multiple competitions. It's a really weird way to support a team, you know, especially as an American who like, we think we can win the title every season in every other league, right? I'm a Dodger. I'm an LA yeah. guy. So Dodgers, Lakers, Kings, all that. But, but yeah, it's just, it's interesting to be like, yeah, if we can just get 12th this year, I'm going to love life. You know, it's just, it's just, it's a weird concept. It's it's too big a club to. I mean, it's just too big a club to um, to to celebrate mediocrity. But but that being said, knowing very recently and seeing what's happening to Sunderland, you know your great rivals. Like, of course, survival becomes not only incredibly financially um, rewarding and and the leverage that it gives you to be able to build and chase higher aspirations, like. It's essential to survive. It's just, it is kind of crazy. And I, I just, I look at some of the teams over the past few years and think like what, what remarkable underachievers in, mm -hmm. in, in so many ways. And like, you know, Rafa Benitez is a perfect example. Like things start to go well. You, you find someone who stabilizes things and, and it immediately kind of blows up again. And, and a he said, she said thing between he and, and, and Mike Ashley. So it's a shame because, um, you know, when I grew up, as as you did, you know, those those teams like back in the day. And I remember watching, you know, um, Owen and Ginola and, and Shearer and, and Espria and just like I honestly like one of the first beers I drank um, in high school because I didn't drink much. I normally like pour it out in the plant because like I had a game the next yeah, day yeah. and I was like, get it. But like I, I would buy Newcastle simply because of <laughs> that's amazing. No, and I respect that. Uh, so, yeah, I guess I'm just. I'm just frustrated, and I know there's people in the comments uh, that are going to... Well, Fish says, I thought Steve Bruce was going to be a disaster. I don't know. I think he's good at managing mid-table purgatory teams, frankly. I, I think that's kind of his sweet spot. Whereas Rafa Benitez didn't have the talent that I think he needed to really execute. And, and my only knock on Rafa Benitez, and this goes for any manager, he's playing at home against teams that were of similar quality or less, and he'd still concede possession to them, and I hate that more than anything. Like, you're at home, man. Step on people's throats and get after it. Uh, there, was a ban there, there was a banner, Jimmy, like, um, I remember it really, really well. It was maybe like three or four seasons ago. And um, New I remember the Newcastle fans putting up a banner that said, we don't demand a team that wins, we demand one that tries. And it was like, 
you know, a kind of a different different sentiment than what you're saying. Listen, I think every Newcastle fan aspires inspire to be in Europe and all these other things, but like just the the requisite belief in energy and competitiveness for so long, like hasn't even been there in, in, in many seasons. So at least Bruce and, and Benitez, even if you don't love the the way they're playing, there has been a little bit of a resurgence of like just a spirit about the group, you know? No, no, that's fair. And I mean, I'll take that. And I think uh, Miguel Almiron in particular has done uh, very well um, to, well, at least show that MLS has got some players too. And I like that angle always. All right, let's get into the top three, bottom four. I'm showing the table right now. Uh, I think we can all agree that Liverpool is going to win the league. They deserve to win the league. And I'm glad the league's back so they can confirm it, even though I'm sure there's some other fans that are like, oh, it's not real. I got stopped because of whatever. You guys need to shut up. So we could say it's between City or Liverpool. Uh, but it's not. Um, I think it's more about when Liverpool is going to win the league. Are they going to do it at the Etihad versus, versus Man City on, on the 7th of July or two days after that at Anfield when they host uh, Aston Villa? There's a part of me that thinks they're going to lose the City, maybe for, I don't know, competitive reasons, of course, but but maybe it'd just be cooler, I think, for them to win it uh, in front of their home fans uh, at Anfield. Uh, just for the top four, I'll go really quick on my, my, my thoughts. Man City obviously seems like a lock. They're going to be okay, I think. But I can't say the same for Leicester and, and Chelsea, who are currently third and fourth. Uh, Leicester have games against Everton, Arsenal, Sheffield, Spurs, and United on the final day. That is a really tough schedule. Uh, Chelsea have an easier schedule, but they also have games against City and Liverpool. Uh, and two London derbies, so those are always a little bit tricky. Uh, then for the other hopefuls, United look like they're going to be okay, especially if Pogba and Rashford are healthy. Uh, they're rejoining a team that's won nine out of their last 11. They were in good form prior to the pandemic, so we'll see if they can keep that up. And then Wolves and Sheffield, you just don't know. I mean, you got to love their spirit, uh, so it's really hard to say. I think maybe Spurs, but I, I don't know. I mean, Kane and, and, and Hingman's son are going to be back, and I think hungry for goals, though it looks like Kane's hungry for other things. I don't know if you've seen him put on okay that was a bad joke but you guys know what i'm trying to say so kyle i'm gonna throw it to you then um who, who are you going with your on your top four um i think it stays the same with one change um and and this isn't a slight on chelsea or frank lamport or, or or anything i just think it very much is still a transitional group i'm excited that pulisic got the chance to get back fit healthy looks hungry to go mm-hmm. I, I just i liked manchester united as we were heading into um you know the break where where they suspended the league and it's hard to know obviously what's going on behind the scenes but time for rashford time for pogba time for for others to get fit get healthy time for there to be an actual training session where McTominay, Fernandez, and Pogba get to play on the same field together, maybe in the same team together, in the same um, plan together. I, I like Manchester United's chances to get into the top four. Yeah, and I kind of hope that they do it. There's something about Manchester United being good that I appreciate. It, it just, yeah. it, it just, it just feels better. What about? Manchester, uh, United, fans, Manchester United fans feel like I hate them. It's so funny. Like you know, you've done this <laughs> job well. When every team thinks that you hate their team and well, that you love another. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I mean, it's Creator K says in the comments, it's wild that Arsenal could easily be out of the top 10. Uh, where, where do you think Arsenal are going to are gonna settle? Do you think they can they can make it a Europa League run? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the interesting thing about the top four, obviously, is, is, the, is the, the ban for Manchester City, right? It open, opens things up a little bit. Um, so I, I like what Arteta's doing. I think it's taken a while. I think he's at least, um, what's going on there. It's demonstrative of what he said initially, what we all kind of knew, which is that culturally, which is what you don't see and can't really put your finger on. There needed to be a serious revamp of what it meant to be a part of Arsenal football club and be in that group. And I think for the most part, he's gotten that right. There were a lot of draws in that first stretch that they would look a lot different in the table right now if they were able to transition to wins. Yeah, for sure. And then what about Spurs? Where, where are you feeling about Mourinho? Uh, do you feel like he's just he, – you think the game's passed Mourinho by? I mean, it's just – it's – the guy had the magic for so long, and then it just seems like he doesn't have that same type of spark. But but maybe now with this pandemic, maybe because he's had more more time without that pressure with his players – Maybe he can pull some magic out of his hat. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't think ultimately, and I understand, unlike when he went to Manchester United, which I, from the beginning, 
was against, thought was a bad idea. Um, you know, I, I, I would say some people could argue the getting back in top four, winning Europa League are, are a demonstration of it being worth it. I, I saw Manchester United fans who were very upset with my anti Mourinho sentiment early on, you know, joining the bandwagon towards the end. I don't feel that way initially. Like, I, I saw the calculated risk in what Daniel Levy was trying to do by bringing Mourinho to Spurs. Um, but I, I, right before the break, we were seeing signs of the negative, you know, antagonistic, unsure uh, Mourinho coming out really early. So I guess the positive is he's had a chance to kind of like calm down and revamp. Uh, get some players back, obviously, like others. But I just, I think long term, the project's not going to work. All right, now let's talk a little bit about relegation because I think Norwich are done. I, I just don't think they're going to catch. I think there's too much action. Unless they go on some unbelievable run, uh, Pookie might score, I don't know, 50 goals. I think they're going to need it from him to make that happen. Brighton, for me, should be a little bit nervous because they're only two points above the relegation zone, as we can see. But they face Arsenal. Leicester, Man United, Liverpool, and Man City. Uh, I just, I just don't see them getting a lot of points uh, out of those games, if any, and that could, that could signal their doom. Uh, the other spot could be Aston Villa's. I hope not. I have a soft spot for Aston Villa. Brad Guzan played there for a long time in goal, but they have a tough schedule as well, with six of their ten games in the top half of the table, and there's only so much Jack Relish can do um, if he's not running into trash cans with his car. Is that a low blow? And then there's a case to be made for Watford, who are going to probably. Well, they might be out without their skipper, I think, Troy Deeney, for a while. Uh, and then Bournemouth faced four of the top eight within the space of 11 days. Who do you think is going to get relegated, Kyle Martino? That's that's my question to you. So um, Aston Villa, Norwich, and then you know the one other for me is between um, Watford and Brighton. I, 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 I share your concerns with Brighton, obviously the difficulty of schedule. I mean, Graham Potter, like, I love, I actually love him. Like, he, he's he's easy to listen to. Like, I, he's got great ideas. Um, I like what he's trying to do, and I like mm -hmm. that he's stuck with it. It's just, they, I mean, they, they've been right there the entire season, and it's hard to feel confident they can pull away. You know, there's not a lot of points left in that schedule for them. Um, you know, the Watford side of things has been kind of a mess you know changing managers new players every single season all that change for some reason hasn't really unsettled them but it's kind of finally caught up with them if i had to pick one of the two um i would say brighton yeah I, i'm on the same page with you on that uh we got a couple comments ronnie says did anyone really think norwich wasn't going to get relegated to the start of the season no, I would say the Canaries were definitely in the mix, but then Puki came out of nowhere and just banging in goals. So, you know, I thought that would maybe that would help. Elemano says, would Norwich trade the feeling of beating Man City against the odds to stay up in the league? Uh, Ronnie again says Norwich is just happy to be invited to the party. So, yeah, not a lot, a lot, not a lot of love for, for Norwich. Uh, Fish does, does say, I'm almost certain Watford are staying up. Nobody has that kind of turnaround, then screws it up. I don't know. You, you just never know, Kyle Martino. You just never I, know. I definitely. I definitely. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't want. I don't want to see the cherries go down. I don't want to see hammers go down or Watford. Brighton, I feel like, had a nice little run at the top. Um, you know, they need to go I down. Kind of. I don't want to see anybody but, go down. That's true. That's true. It's 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 why it's so good. That it is. All right, now we're gonna get into some awards. You ready for this? Putting you on the spot, yeah. Kyle Martino. Uh, this first one is Manager of the Year, and I gotta Ooh. fix your your you're small again. It's it's. I'm not doing that on purpose to make me feel bigger about I, myself. I, I promise you. I, I, I shrunk. I shrunk when it got difficult. <laughs> uh, and your three options are Chris Wilder, Jurgen Klopp, yep. and Brendan Rodgers, who has the best teeth in the game outside of Luis Suarez and Bobby I Firmino. Mean, I, like there, there is a legitimate argument for e each one of these. I think it's between Klopp and Wilder. Um, and it's just, it's kind of as as impressive and incredible as overlapping. I mean, you would have loved to play. I mean, you, you you were center back, sometimes fullback. You would have loved to play in a Chris Wilder system. I mean, you would have been thriving um, with his just, to, to bring new ideas to the modern game when you have a league full of the minds that we enjoy with uh, Pep Guardiola and, and, but, and Klopp and, but, and, and many and the, others. Like, he doesn't have the talent of those other teams either, if oh, we're no, being honest. Not even, 
even close, not even close. So I just I mean, 30 year wait and also like the crescendo of it getting better and building and the dominance of Liverpool this year. It's got to be Jurgen Klopp. OK, we only got a couple votes for Klopp. I mean, well, maybe more than a couple, but there's a lot of Wilder shouts in there. Chike, Big Dan, yeah. Elemeno, all going for Wilder. I think there's something to be said. And I think that's the big argument when we talk about, let's say, Pep Guardiola in particular. We think, OK, well, he's managed Barcelona with the world's best player with Messi. He goes to Bayern Munich and and he has got a great, talented team, right? And they win trophies whether he's there or not. That's how good they are. Then he goes to Man City. It took him a year, but he he implemented his style, and he obviously spends a ton of money to get some of the best players in the world. Could he do it with a Sheffield United? Could he do better? Or could Jurgen Klopp do better with the same quality players that, that Chris Wilder has at his disposal? I'm not so sure, and I think that's why you have to bring it into the— We'll never know. We'll never know. <laughs> that's true. All right, cool. All right, so that's manager of the year. Let's go to Let's go to surprise of the year. Okay, and here are your three options, uh, Tammy Abraham, uh, Treori, and Calvert-Lewin, who have all, I mean, we all knew they were talented. There was no, no, no denying their talent, but who do you think was the biggest surprise based on their performance? Um, you know, I'm kind of leaning towards Tammy Abraham because you could always see it with Treori. Uh, Calvert-Lewin's always had it too. It just, I guess Tammy Abraham really just flourished once he became the, the true number nine for Chelsea. Yeah, I, I think... Um... Tammy Abraham, um, I think Tammy, uh, Tammy Abraham and and Adama Traore. It's between them. Uh-huh. I'm gonna say Traore because um, two reasons. One is last time he was in the Premier League, like the finished product, it, it just was never. It was never there. Like we saw the like, you know, beating players. We saw the speed. We saw the transition. We saw the strength. And then we'd see a shanked cross like over the crossbar <laughs> or some ridiculous attempt to dribble more players. You know, to be asked to initially when he came into the team, pl- do it as a wing back, right? Like that that was pretty incredible to as a player that obviously thinks and, and this isn't disrespectful to the role, but coming out of Barcelona and the player he thinks he is, you know, he thinks he's an attacking wearing or thinks he's more of an advanced player. And then, you know, has played several different roles, sometimes even played up top in a two, depending on the tactics. Like everywhere he's played and everything that's been asked of him. He's completely unplayable. Was it Pep Guardiola that they asked how they were going to deal with him? And he said, I'm going to get a motorcycle. <laughs> Which is a great response, by the way. Which would work. Yeah, yeah. So your your answer is who? Traore? Traore, yeah. Okay, yeah. I respect that. Now, he's, he's definitely done a lot of damage into Manchester City in particular. And I think them beating, Wolves beating them early on gave Liverpool the confidence that maybe this was their time to make it happen. And and I think that's when the, the separation started in some ways and make really de- dented. No, it's all good. Uh, also, I kind of wanted to ask you about while we have Tammy Abraham on the, on the, on our lips, let's say Timo Werner potentially coming into Chelsea. Uh, I assume you're a fan of that move, but well, what does that mean for Tammy Abraham? Do you, do you think he gets displaced? You just put Tam, uh, Timo Werner out on the wings and let Tammy Abraham still be the guy or, or um, you'd like to think, at least on paper, that it'll elevate his game. But again, you never know. You know, I think I think of this. Um, I think of it in a similar way that Rashford's been at Manchester United, right? Like Lukaku, they bring him in, they push him wide. Um, you know, then then Sanchez and others. Like there was always this, like I gotta get out of the way, and mm-hmm. it's like. Frank Lampard's done such a great job, and he did it with Christian Pulisic out of the gate. It's like. And you know this. We were always this way. Like, you don't want to be able to walk into the team. Like, you want competition. You know, if, if you're walking into the team every weekend, you're either one of the best players in the world or you need to be You need to be in a more challenging environment. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I think it's healthy competition for him. And I, and I don't think at all it pushes him out of that spot. All right. I appreciate that insight. With regard to... They're basically some... loading up on, like, crazy I know. talented wingers, you know, and... Yeah, no, Zayac is going to be going to be a good one as well. Obviously, they're oh. in the the hunt for uh, Kai Havertz or Jaden Sancho. It's I worry a little bit for Christian Pulisic because we need that guy to get minutes in meaningful games. Uh, that's that's my own bias. Now, this surprise of the year has actually been split in the comments, Kyle. There's uh, Calvert Lewin. Uh, people are saying Traore. People saying Tammy. Uh, it's it's kind of all over the place. So that's been pretty interesting. Uh, Elemeno says that someone has to get the shaft with all these new players coming into Chelsea. We just hope that it's Mason Mount and not Christian Pulisic. <laughs> I'm sure if you're English, you're thinking the other thing. 
That reminds me of, um, I remember there was a, uh, who was it? It was um, Michael Carrick was on like a call-in show and someone called in or someone like tweeted in a question and it was, um, it was, if you could, if you could tell any, or no, it was, if you could cut any player from Manchester United right now, how would you tell cleverly? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's such oh amazing. What an amazing lead. That's, that's awesome. All right, let's move to the next one. The best new signing. Now for me, Harry Maguire, who was probably a little overpriced in the transfer market, but they filled the need. Uh, he really elevated his game once Ole gave him the captain's armband, and I think that was a shrewd move by uh, Mr. Gunnar Solskjaer to do that. Uh, Danny Ings, even though he was on loan, he just officially signed with Southampton, so you know, and he's been very important for them. He's only a few uh, goals off the top of the Golden Boot race, and then Bruno Fernandez. I don't think Manchester United has lost since he's been in the team. Even though he hasn't played as much of a role, I think it's clear that maybe they should have signed him as uh, last summer. Uh, which one of these guys in particular do you think has been the best signing? So I'm going to say Bruno Fernandez. Um, you know, maybe not on body of work, like I think you were inferring right there, but more yeah. on like to come into that club and from the second he stepped on the field, say like, I I'm taking over, like get, you know, get me the ball. I'm going to run things. I'm going to take penalties. You know, um, his first game, I think he tried a lot. You know, and, and the fans were excited. They loved it. They enjoyed it. And then he started to kind of fall into his rhythm. And by the way, you know, that, that was without their strongest group. There were a lot of injuries to that midfield. So he, he wasn't really playing with, um, you know, the group will probably see, you know, roll out here when things get going again. I just, I think he is, a, he is what, when you say a Manchester United player, right? Like caliber, character, skill, you, you know the comfort on the ball creativity like it's it's all there man he's 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 solid i mean what a good signing and we haven't seen him play with pogba yet if i'm not mistaken so i oh. wonder because because fernandez right. seems like one of those players who you want to play with you know if you, you you know when you play we when we used to play there'd always be players on other teams like god probably be pretty awesome to play with that guy. And I think Bruno Fernandes has those qualities because he makes the game easier for everybody around him. So I'm curious to see how that that all or how he impacts when that team is fully healthy. Now, there's a lot of shouts, though, for Danny Ings. Now, I want to make it clear that he scored 43% of his team's goals this season. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a lot. That, that's a big percentage. And without him, we, we, we could argue they'd be in a relegation fight. Um, do, do, do you, I assume you see Danny Ings the same way, but it's almost been revel, revelatory for him because I just he seemed like he would never really reach these numbers again. Listen, I would say if you're if you're measuring on on um, size of impact, right? Like if if you're saying this season, not not thinking bigger picture, longer term, like this season, like right now, like size of impact, um, and also the stakes of what would it be like without them? It's it's kind of a lock, right? Like, yeah, yeah. They are a totally different team without without Danny Ings, and they are more more likely than not, as you said, getting relegated. So yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good shot. But I like your Bruno Fernandez shout. I, I I can I can see that as well. All right, let's go to our, our last one, uh, player of the year. Now I went with guys that weren't necessarily the top goal scorers. You got Virgil Van Dyke, uh, for obvious reasons. You got Kevin De Bruyne, who's leading the league in assists, and obviously just when he's healthy, is there a better player in the league? It's hard to say. You got Dean Henderson. Uh, who's doing very, very well. And he's still only the third-choice goalkeeper for Manchester United. I assume they're going to call him back at some point once De Gea says he finally wants to go back to Real Madrid if they can get Courtois out of there. I don't know. There's a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, and, and in some ways, I feel like Firmino, Salah, and Mane kind of split the difference. You know, I mean, they, they're so good, but they're also so deadly together that maybe it's hard to pick one. Uh, Jamie Vardy. You know, he's leading the Golden Boot late race with 19. Aubameyang, is, is, he's also had 43% of his contributions for goals uh, for Arsenal, who de are desperate in need of those. So I don't know if these are necessarily the three that you had gone with, but these are my three options for you right now. So um, I'll, Van Dyke would, is my choice. That's what I'd go with. I mean, guy's an absolute Rolls Royce, and it's incredible. <laughs> I love that description. Um, I, I, will, I will say honorable mention, and it's funny, like, I've thought about this a few times this season. I'm going to say Sadio Mane. And uh, this is why. Like, I, I think you make a great point. It's kind of hard to pick one of those out because there's this, like, triad. And, like, you know, they they just feed and work so well together and are threatening at different times. 
But if you watch games, and and we have this tactical camera, so I can I can see things that that aren't aren't you know, on the broadcast and when you've been in the studio and you've been doing games, like, you know what I'm talking about, where mm -hmm. we get this like view that kind of helps you see like, what's the real picture here? Sala doesn't play any defense, like uh, almost, almost none. The system is predicated on him cheating a little bit. And sometimes even being the high central player and Firmino either dropping into the hole or having to chase wide, like the system is totally set up so that Sala very rarely has to be anywhere close to his, his defensive third. Mane, on the other hand, in order for that system to work, he has to be honest and he has to track and he has to be back there doing the defensive side of things. So to be as productive as he's been and a threat like he's been, um, having to kind of carry an unbalanced load at times, like I, I give him a lot of credit for that. And as someone that rarely tracked back and got yelled at by by people a lot like <laughs> i wish i was more Saudi Omani. <laughs> we're gonna get and, into we're gonna get into your career we're gonna get into your career after halftime don't you worry but there's a lot of shots for kdb which i find that's surprising but just given the fact that liverpool's been so dominant can you really give the player of the year award to a manchester city player i, I just don't know if you can i mean he he's he is the best passer in the league and yeah. like the assists are not luck. It's incredible some of the assists he's had this year. All right. Before we get into Lone Sign Cell, which is going to be a good one, going to put a lot of pressure on Kyle Martino. As you guys know, I, I have some deep soccer thoughts sometimes, so check this out. We all know David Luiz is not that good. So do people think he's better than he is because of his hair? I mean... You would be lying if you said he doesn't look like a majestic lion running through the grass, hair bouncing with each stride as he looks for his next meal. And just so we're clear, meal is a metaphor for defensive air leading to a goal. But are we distracted by the hair? Would David Luiz have been worth $130 million in transfer fees if he was bald? Like a modern day Pascal Sigon? Wait a second, I have amazing hair too. Does this mean I'm overrated? Jeez, I hope not. So let's just give every player the same haircut. That way no one gets confused. And let's go with the R9 Ronaldo hair for everyone. Damn, that was deep. Oh yeah, it's time for a little lone sign sell with <laughs> the very small Kyle Martino. And uh, Kyle, this is going to be a tough one for you. We, we try to put all of our guests on the spot. Now, you work with three very talented people, Rebecca Lowe, Robbie Earl, and Robbie Musto. And so this is the challenge for you. Which one, if you were a manager, or let's say a production head, would you want to sign to make sure you keep 100% your MVP? One would you loan out, maybe go get some experience and then come back and help the team later? And who do you just you sell out right? You just can't deal with them anymore. <laughs> there, is, there is zero chance I answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So you're just, you're, the transfer window, you're just going to sign all of them. That's, that's the I, plan. I, I, I'm, I'm basically going to be in financial fair play um, trouble and, and we're going to be brought up on charges and banned from the Champions League next year. <laughs> signing all of them and we do not have the, the, the revenue to justify that. I get it. I get it. Well, there's one uh, J.B. Kroger says he'd sign Rebecca, which it's hard to argue that. He'd loan out Robbie Earl and then sell Robbie Musto. Sorry, Robbie Musto. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Halftime is coming up and then we're going to do some between two. Yeah, what's up? What's up? No, I was gonna say I get this, I, I I obviously am signing myself. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, that, that goes without saying. That goes without saying. All right, we're gonna go uh, halftime. Get out those orange slices. We'll be right back with more Kyle Martino right after this.
Welcome back. It's me and Kyle Martino for the second half of the Power Hour. I'm going to get this fixed, Kyle. Don't you worry. Signing, signing Kyle. Signing Kyle. That is definitely the way to go. Now, we got some questions for you because we asked at halftime for people to ask you uh, something specific about your career or anything that's been happening with you. And uh, Creator K wants to know, what's the best goal that you've ever scored in detail? Um, ooh. There's such a long list, Jenny. You know I, mean? <laughs> I, th I think what's interesting, though, is that you only played professionally for what six, six or seven seasons? Seven seasons, yeah. Wow, yeah, yeah. why so? Why so short? I think that's my question coming out of halftime. Like, what, what, what's the impetus for um, that? Well, I ended up having um, a series of really, really bad injuries, and um, I would say starting with that ankle in the Confederations Cup, and then tore my hip before. Um, 2006 and then the other one in 2007 you know the body just wouldn't let me do it anymore and so I remember sitting there with Bert Mandelbaum who you know the U.S. team doctor and um, he and Gearhart and the other support staff that we have that we're lucky to have between the Galaxy and um, U.S. Soccer basically said I mean I was looking at a hip replacement if I kept doing what I was doing and what I was doing was going in basically every month to get an injection deep into my hip joint that I'd have to sit in a room and you've done these things too, like have an x-ray and take out blood and do, you know, and synthesize it, do the platelets, yeah, do yeah. the thin vit. I was doing all these things and it was just deteriorating my, my, my joint. And, um, you know, I just wasn't the player that I used to be, even though I could still, you know, get by, I wasn't having as much fun and like my quality of life wasn't going to be there afterwards. And so like, I just broke down crying when I decided to record with Mandelbaum for, you know, for insurance and everything that like the recommendation was I never play the game again. And part of it was relief because like I was just in agony towards the mm -hmm. end of my career. I thought yeah. of my best goal. Um, okay. it, I mean, not, not, not in it's being beautiful, but more like meant so much to me, my one and only one for the U S against uh, El Salvador. Uh, was it El Salvador? Yeah, World uh, Cup qualifier. Or Panama, or it was at Gillette. I remember that. And it was it was uh, Albright played the ball over the top, took it out of the air, first time on the left foot, and uh, it felt good. It felt good to score for the U.S. Well, what else feels good is your hair in this picture right now, uh, playing for what? the U.S. Youth National Team. I mean, you were a really really bright star coming out uh, of our youth game here in this country, and. And so it's got to be really disappointing, I think, to go out injured like you did. Because I don't – it's funny because everybody wants to have that storybook ending for your career. But more often than not, 99% of the players don't have that. Usually your damaged goods or if you're on the wrong side of 30, they, you know, they don't see you the same way. And that's usually uh, the more true story arc. But, but tell us about what's going on in this picture and, and how much it meant to you to be part of the, the youth national team scene. Yeah, so that's my good buddy, Matt Oliver. I played with him at University of Virginia. Phenomenal player, was a captain, um, just incredible guy. And we were, this was probably some youth tournament that we were in, you know, I can tell. With the, when I, Anytime that flag comes out, right, like there's some sort of, you know, Toulon tournament or something like that. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it makes me emotional. Um, f finally, in a good way, you know, I, I, when I decided to retire, I was 28 and stayed away from the game almost completely because I was so devastated. My career ended that way. Um, and you know, when I think back about it, you know, at this point, I remember like in this, uh, it sounds obnoxious, but just to kind of give you context, like Gatorade player of the year. And I was on the cover of soccer America and I was supposed to be like tab or Claudio and, you know, American number 10, we don't make these often. And so like, 
there was a lot of expectation, but I liked it. You know, I don't, but that, that was something I, you know, we all play for that, right? Like we don't want to you know, be out of the challenge or out of the, 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 the hype or out of the expectation. Like we want to, we want to try and, and extend our career or our talent to the absolute top it can go. And so how I looked at my career was I failed in that. Like I, I was I was on this track to become, and a lot of it was speculative. You know, at this point, I'm probably 19, um, and you know, with Landon and Bees and all of us kind of at the similar age, you know, we were all kind of this this next generation that were coming up, and like, love those guys tremendously, and I'm so impressed with them. And like, as younger guys, they're they're role models to me and, and idols to me. But like, Landon's a perfect example. Like, you know, Landon, that hype was there and he did it. And like, maybe some even said, like, kind of went even further and, and, and bees as well. And it's like, to not have su succeeded in my dream of playing in a World Cup and not, not have stayed on that track, like, I blamed myself a lot and thought of my career as a massive failure. Like, in my mind, that's what it felt like because I knew. Some of the hype, you know, to be the next Claude or be the next Tab. I mean, these guys are incredible. I was, I just wanted to be the next player Kyle, that could excite and Kyle be a Martino. Bit. You wanted to be the first Kyle Martino. But like, I knew I didn't fulfill what I could have done. Like, I, I know I didn't get there. So I was really hard on myself. And then I know now in hindsight, like I was suffering with depression and like it, it that disappointment of getting off track. And it hurting to play and knowing I wasn't the player anymore, not being able to do the things I could do, not being in the camps as often, not getting to go to the World Cup. All those things started to really take my love of the game away and like really bring depression on in a big way. And I think some of the relief was like my body collapsing in a way gave me an excuse to not go find that I was really struggling with depression. And it was it was one of the reasons my career was falling apart. So. And I appreciate you being this uh, transparent and open with us. When did you start feeling like you weren't going to live up to your own expectations, and maybe the expectations of others? Was it when you were with the crew? We have a photo up now of your glow, your flowing hair, by the way. But, but, at what point did that start to seep in? Because I feel like once that starts to seep in, it's hard to shut that door. It's hard to it's hard yeah. to close that doubt. So it was. Um... That tackle, if I found the moment, that tackle against Cameroon at the Confederations Cup, and I like I can I can feel it still and I can live it still. Um, we were going straight from it was that rare year where we were going straight from the Confederations Cup to the Gold Cup. And as you know, like being so in, incredibly you have to be lucky, but obviously as talented enough and timing wise to make it to a World Cup. I mean that is such an incredibly difficult thing to accomplish and very, very few make it there. You need these other tournaments, right? Like those are your kind of trials to see if you can really piece together enough body of work to be able to convince a coach like they can get it done. It's tournament. So I had the Confederations Cup and the Gold Cup was coming right after it. And, and having suffered that injury in a game that I was performing, probably the best I, I'd ever played for the U.S., took me off track and it was the first moment doubt and and um and and disappointment and anxiety and all these other things and an ankle that never truly healed you know as you know ligaments never really heal you just find a way to strengthen around them and get things back like i never got back on track like i got back into the u.s team i got into an all-star team like i did those things but in my mind i can track it all back to that moment and like I was 20, I was maybe 23. And like, that was it. I never got back on track from that moment. And some of that was like, I can be honest now, like I wasn't mentally strong enough to like, I wasn't mentally strong enough to handle that and then the hip injury and to like keep rebounding with everything that was going on in my life. Like I just couldn't do it. How, how long were you out with that ankle injury? Not long enough. And, and, and that's, that's the problem is, you know, Jimmy, I, 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 when I tore my hip, I got called into, Bruce called me into the 34 uh, or the 30, it was like 35 or 40 maybe or 35, 35 players for the camp before he picked the World Cup team. Yeah. Um, in 2000, like before 2006. Right. And the surgery, I did a whole orthoscopic surgery and veil on my hip and a labrum um, repair and all that was supposed to be um, 
eight weeks to, to, to weight bearing and beginning jogging. Okay. I played against South Korea at eight weeks in, in the camp and did irreparable damage to my body. And, and like, I just knew like, you don't get like, I can't be like, no next world cup cycle. Right. Like, right. So, so do, you, do you regret that, that choice then? Um, cause I mean, uh, you, I mean, at, at that point, I feel like you, if you didn't take that risk, if you didn't take that chance, cause maybe it would have worked out, you would have maybe regretted it more down the line. If you just don't know, man, that's such a big if. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think here's the answer to it is like, I've worked with a therapist now, um, starting in 2010 was when I finally decided to go get mental health support. And, you know, it's changed my life. It's a regular part of my, you know, you know, nutrition and all these other things mm -hmm. that we do to stay healthy. It's a regular part of my regime. Um, you know, the regret's not helpful. It's yeah, just, yeah. it's not, you know, I, I could regret either scenario. What I've been able to see is like how lucky, like how incredible to play this game for a living and like meet the people I've met and see the places I've seen, be on a field with the guys that are in this picture that when I was little, you know, I was watching some of them and thinking, man, if I could only, you know, get this shirt signed by them, right? Like to have the career I've had, it's so easy to think about being falling off track or going back too early or all these things, but like, what a gift, like what an incredible gift. No. So what happened to me, and this is going to sound pretty crazy, but my biggest bout I'd say of depression during my career was after the world cup, because I had achieved everything that I set out to achieve and then some. I, I never really envisioned that I'd play in a World Cup. I mean, you have hopes and dreams, but it didn't really come into a, a clear picture until I maybe a year out and I first got into the national team. I was playing in a Gold Cup going, all right, I think I, think I maybe might be able to sneak onto this team. I might be able to win them over here. And so that ended up happening. And then afterwards, we got we crashed out. And, and what's really weird is when you crash out of the tournament, that all the hope that you had in the hotel after, like during the tournament when there was still a chance to maybe advance and you don't know what's going to happen yet, the, once it's officially over, it is a ghost town. And it feels, it feels so weird uh, that it's over and it's done. And all this buildup for so many years and your whole life was built to do that. And then it's just gone. It's done. Yeah. I came back and thought, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to, first of all, I've always been somebody that's been like trying to gain on somebody else. So now I'm like at the top of the mountain going, well, I don't know. There's no other mountain to climb. Now I remember Sunil shaking my hand after we got knocked out him going, well, well you know, we got another four years to do this. And I immediately thought, yo, I don't know if I have it in me to do another four years. I really don't. And, and I felt depressed. The weird part was Kyle, I just didn't feel comfortable going to talk to a therapist when I needed to because I felt like it was weird for me to complain about play, playing in a World Cup. I mean, you know how weird that is to say, oh, you know, I'm, I feel so bad for myself. I just played in a World Cup. But it really wasn't – I made the wrong correlation there because I really feel like I just needed somebody to talk to to kind of work through a, a, this achievement but then not knowing who – like who can relate to that in some ways? And there was only a handful of people maybe, and they didn't want to talk about it because we crashed. It was just really weird. So I, I anyway, mean, to, get, to get to your point, I broke my jaw. Clint Dempsey broke my jaw and I got to sit out eight weeks. I had, to, I couldn't play for eight weeks and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. So thank you to Clint Dempsey for breaking my jaw because I got that break mentally from, from the pressure and, and not knowing what to do. The, the choice was made for me and that brought me so much relief. Yeah. And I'm sorry to hear that, man. And like, you know, I appreciate you talking about it as well. Like, you know, um, I, like, I think we can forgive ourselves knowing that like one of the reasons I decided to speak publicly about str struggling with depression, which is the scariest like send button I've ever pushed in my life was like, I wish that someone talked about it when I like, you know, when, when, when I was playing, like, I wish, I wish it was, um, here, hold on one second. No, you're good. I wish it was, I wish it was like, I wish we normalized quicker and, and someone, and the, you know, the environment wasn't there. It was a different time, but someone normalized what struggling with mental health issues is so that we could understand like it is, isn't, you know, you're not a pariah. It's no, it's no weakness. It's no, you're not damaged. There's just, it's just another challenge that you're going to face. Like, 
struggling with hamstring injuries or these other things that go on that we have so much support for. So like, you know, it's great that you and others like speak about it because there's young kids coming up now that will get the support we didn't get. Yeah. And hopefully, as you say, we'll get normalized so that they feel comfortable talking because it's important. You have to express yourself. Yeah. I mean, even in our relationships, I just had a talk with my wife the other day. I'm like, I know this might sound ridiculous, but I just need to say it, you know? So that's all. That's a whole different uh, conversation I think that we can have. I really appreciate your time. And I just want to say for the audience, we really appreciate the tour of your house. Uh, yeah, it's so been awesome. I'm, just, I'm basically just trying to, to avoid any room where there's, there, there is a drill or a saw or something going. It's, it's like a whack-a-mole game of audio. <laughs> no, no I, I appreciate you being a pro because you know what that means since uh, you're in the space yourself. Uh, well, so I'm, throw, I'm throwing up a picture right now of Raquel May. What, oh. So I've got a couple of photos for you, and I appreciate your time, and we'll let you go. It's, this has been awesome, by the way. Uh, tell us about Raquel May, because and actually, before you do that, I want to give you a quick story where we played against Argentina in the Copa America in 2007. And this dude, I don't know if you've heard the story or not, this no. dude did, didn't tie his shoes for the first 20 minutes of the game, Kyle Martino. He didn't tie his shoes for a Copa America game. Like, that, I'm like, that is so disrespectful, but also super awesome at the same time. Like, I don't even go to men's league games now and see people that have untied shoes because they're just big time for everybody. The dude didn't tie his shoes. So we score first, okay? Eddie Johnson gets in. It's a penalty. He ends up scoring 1-0. And I was so upset. It's like 10 minutes into the game. I grab Raquel May's arm and I point to like, okay, tie your shoes, pal. Right? And then I went and celebrated with Eddie. Okay, so fast forward maybe 15, 20 minutes. Uh, they have a free kick. The guy bends down, ties his shoes. He drops a diamond and they score 1-1. We end up losing 4-1. The lesson here, the moral of the story is, don't ever tell Raquel May to tie his goddamn shoes because you're going to lose the goddamn game. All right? So... So, but I got to love him. You got to love Raquel May for not tying his shoes. And, and, uh, what a special player it was also, uh, it was an honor to, to play against him because the guy's next level. Um, I mean, so Argentine football in general means a lot to me. I grew up watching Boca juniors. I, you know, I just found, it was one of the things I found right when I was young, everyone's got their kind of, especially in our generation where you couldn't sit there and on your phone, watch every single game from every single league. Like, I found that, in, you know, I, River Plate, Boca, and Bumanera, and like, and then I found Ortega and Raquel May, and obviously Maradona and Gallardo, and all like, I wanted to shape my game. I very much, and I'm sure every player did this. Like, I I wanted to Frankenstein like certain <laughs> aspects of these of players that I loved, and like they tended to always be the, you know Argentine players, and so like Raquel May. Also, like, just to see someone um, dominate with, like, the reverence and the, like, in the casual nature of it. Like, Zidane's kind of, like, the French version of it, right? It's like, like Ortega's, like, a you know, busy and, and, and Maradona's, like, you know, just a, an alien, right? And, like, Raquel May just brought this re remarkable grace and composure that like I didn't have often enough because I was always like dribbling out of problems I created because I like, oops, I should have seen that this wasn't going to be. <laughs> um, but like, I just loved watching the, the like passion and the balletic nature of his game. I mean, he was, he was something special, man. I do want to say that Kyle is downplaying his ability there was one goal and i should have said this before when we're thinking about your best goal ever it was kansas city versus columbus and i was having a hell of a game i track you in the midfield every once in a while or you'd come up towards the back line and then drop off in the midfield sometimes i follow you sometimes i wouldn't we were tied very late and you got the ball maybe 25 yards off the top of the box you do like a step over push it to your left side and i thought i overplayed your right a little bit because i thought all right end of the game he's gonna want to go to his stronger foot not really taking into account that both of your feet are pretty good. And you do a really good job of creating enough space and you bang one into the top corner to win the game. Do you remember that goal? Because I was pissed. I'm yeah. still pissed. Yeah, yeah. I also remember in the locker room, um, there was a photo one time, I'm sure you'll remember this, where we got like tied up. And, you know, you, you um, if someone watched the game, probably got the better of that of that tussle. But the photo that ended up in the paper, and you had a, you had a, a, a shave. I did. I shaved my head for charity. Yeah. Me, my, my, my hand around your throat. And I was like, I, wouldn't, I will never look tougher. Listen, I, look I, 
I've been I was looking for that photo because because I looked for it online. We couldn't find it, but oh. I feel like I have a copy of the newspaper somewhere because it was in we the Kansas City Star. Yeah, I'll find it. I'll find it and I'll I'll put it out there so everybody you can have, see. Like, a big vein. You, like you look you look like one of the meanest people on the planet. <laughs> and I'm just like. <laughs> yeah, that was that was. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to give you a shout out because that was. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was a great goal, and I was, I'm was i still a little bit bitter that you got the better of me. Uh, and then I want to talk about Street FC really quick. You're you're yeah. doing something to, to give back in a meaningful way and, and providing opportunities for people that might not get them otherwise. And, and how important, I guess, is being able to play anywhere to, to developing your skills? Because I feel like there's a lot of players that – even even the ones that are heavily coached, the ones that are in the DA, they're, they're training every day, they still don't have that area to go be themselves without any pressure to do what the coach wants, to try yeah. things, right? They hear things, they see things. As you say, they get to Frankenstein their game from the favorite players that they get to watch on TV. Where do they get to do that? Because when they're playing for the club teams, I feel like everything is so regimented, they can't be who they maybe want to be. But this is a platform that provides that. So I'm, I'm buzzing that you, you've started this. Well, thanks, man. I, you know, the genesis of, of two really important projects to me, Street FC and Over Under Initiative, came out of the election where I saw some scary stuff. And I would say the issue of consequence that worried me the most was access to the game. You know, there are a lot of problems going on um, that are really disappointing with the way that we're governing the game here. Um, and that's not to say there aren't good things, of course, that are being done and, and, and there's progress being made on many fronts. But I just thought man, we got a real problem because um, one of the meetings I had was with the group that helped me put together the progress plan that we came out with. And Mia Hamm said something I still hear today. And it throws a room full of people at different levels in different parts of the game. And she said, there's an epidemic going on where the kids aren't having fun anymore and we need to wake up. Dude, she nailed it. Wow. I, it was like every, everyone, you know, first when Mia talks, like everyone's like... I really want to hear what she has to say because she, you know, she doesn't just talk like I do just to hear your voice. <laughs> you and me both. Important. <laughs> so um, that that moment, I thought like the, the thing out of this election I want to focus on the most is bringing joy and accessibility back to the game. And I just thought the way I played it growing up was I played mostly on hard skate, um, mostly with uh, different cultures, different ages, different genders. Like it was about getting to a spontaneous pickup game as your laboratory to try things, to be held accountable, to learn about competition, to be mad you lost, to be excited when you won, to be a teammate, to be all the things that some of these environments are getting wrong because they're too sterile and kids are spending, you know, five hours on, on, in a car or on a plane to go play one game. It's like, we have to bring this street, and that's in my mind, the street idea of the game that's manufactured the best players in the world, we have to bring it here and, and, and create an innovative and scalable way to have millions of people playing in this way. And so I thought, well, there's two things. One is an infrastructure plan. Just like there is all over the world, every basketball court has a soccer goal under the hoop. Why, when we have 1,800 basketball courts in, you know, in, in, the, in the five boroughs, why doesn't one of them have a soccer goal under it? So immediately I started this foundation over under initiative where our mission is health and wellness through this solution. Let's go get to all these courts. I designed and engineered a goal that 10 cities have signed up to install under their basketball hoops so that we can begin to shift that paradigm that you can play in this way. And then the next piece with Street FC was, let's build the biggest football club on the planet taking the atom of a pickup game and having millions of members rather than the 40 on your text list or email chain. And let's create the most inclusive and enjoyable format and bring that idea of, of club to the street in a spontaneous way and join all these other amazing groups like, you know, NYC footy and Bowery and, and Venice uh, beach FC and, you know, like everyone that's trying to find their little way to satisfy what is a unsatisfied desire to find and play this game in an enjoyable way whenever you want to. No, I love that. I love that about you. So I'm so glad that you're doing it. We get a lot of comments saying, I wish, I, you know, I can't find pickup games. I wish it was easier to find them. So Street FC, everybody, is probably going to be your best solution in a lot of different ways. And I love the Over Under initiative, man. I love all the stuff that you're doing behind the scenes and uh, and all the work that you're doing uh, off camera because I can tell it means a lot to you. So I, I, uh, I appreciate that. 
Uh, I just like diametrically. Laughing. I just die. And thanks for saying that. I'm just diametrically opposed to this idea that you could be priced out of a game that is the most inclusive and affordable on the planet. Like I just, at a, at a minimum, I just won't accept that. And also, we will win. And I believe this at a molecular level. We will watch our men win a World Cup in our lifetime to join our women as World Cup champions if we're able to unlock the game in the streets. There is no panacea, but if we do only one thing, that will get us close. Did you see that that quote by Zlatan where he said that, you know, $3,500? Like, what what are we even doing? Like, what, what country is going to produce players with that type of format, that type of structure? No, we're getting it wrong, and we got we got to wake up. Now, you ran for U.S. soccer president. I actually, I don't know how much time, I could go into this, so if you got to go, uh, I understand. But you ran for it, and, and it's clear that you learned a lot from the experience. Um, is there a chance that you'll run again, potentially in the future? Or is that kind of, you did it, you learned what you needed to, and now you're going to move on and just try to be better in other ways? I mean, listen, I, I, I won't say that, I, mean, I won't say never. There, there's always a chance. I would say... Um, there's, there's, it's unlikely because a lot of the factors driving me to run, one of them was, and I say this with respect, I disagree with many things he's done and, and, and credit him for a lot of great decisions and, and, um, and service to the game in this country, but it was time for Sneal to go. And yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to stand forward to say, I'm just not going to accept that we don't change in this moment. So it doesn't have to be me, but I will fight to make sure that there is actual change. Um, I think, and I give credit to everyone who stepped forward because it wasn't easy. I think that this next time around will be different. There will be qualified and and courageous and passionate and capable people coming forward for that role. So I, I, I you know, I know this sounds like delus- delusions of grandeur. There are, there are many people better than me to run U.S. soccer in this country. And I, I'm confident some of these people finally step forward and feel they have a chance to do that role. Yeah, J.B. Kroger says in there, we need someone like you running USSF. Uh, because we need someone who gets it. And I, 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 I now I guess I'm, I'm, I'm emboldened by the fact that at least we're having more former players kind of infiltrate the ranks in some ways. I know Brian McBride just got involved. Uh, Cindy Parlo Cohn has now been thrusted into Cindy, it. I think uh, Cindy Parlo Cohn, people will probably say she's an insider. I think she's great. I, I, I think she's very smart, very courageous, fantastic player. I think she has a lot of the qualities. All right, now to our last topic, then we'll let you go. Thank you again for your time. It's our Soccer Minute, Minute of Appreciation, sponsored by Soccer Minute. And uh, we're going with Robbie Rogers this month. It's Pride Month, uh, and he has been such an important person in this movement for sports. I don't feel like he got the credit he deserved for coming out first in any major sport in this country. Uh, But uh, it doesn't lessen the fact that he took that big first step. I know that you played with him. And he was my roommate with the U.S. men's national team. And I think he's a special guy. And, and his years playing with Guillermo Barros Scalotto were, like, next level. I mean, well, Scalotto's next level. But, but, but I just thought – and I told him this. I remember pulling him aside after a game going, I love when you run with purpose. When Robbie Rogers runs with purpose – and when you play with players like Scalotto, you can because he can deliver the ball exactly where you want. But but Robbie Rogers was a different player when he ran with purpose and belief in what he was doing and what he was about. And and I say that because I feel like that translates to him coming out because now he finally was was being himself with purpose. And I feel like we're seeing the, like a, an amazing Robbie Rogers and and all of his colors. And and I think the world's a better place because uh, he he stood up for who he was and what he believed in and and. Uh, yeah, so that was my minute of appreciation for Robbie Rogers. Uh, anything you'd like to add to that, Kyle yeah, Martino? I'd love to add to that, I, and, and thank you for highlighting him, and I think it's a perfect way to bookend this because we started with talking about courageous players using their platforms, and um, man, what a difficult thing to do what he did and the bravery it took. Um, I'll just tell you one story. I've told it before, but I played with David Testo, who um, mm-hmm. phenomenal player, wonderful guy, um, I'd have known him from the youth national teams and he confided in me one day um, after practice and told me that he was gay and um, was was just so worried about other players on the team finding out. And, so, and, and, you know, to go back to talking about and I'm not comparing them at all, but just for context, like living with with, with and playing with depression and like the challenges that that I faced with that. I couldn't imagine living with that secret. I couldn't imagine going into that locker room and not being able to be yourself or being scared about 
how you'll be judged if you are your true self when you're in there. And the fact that they performed at the level they performed, uh, having to carry that burden make, makes them heroes to me. Like I, I, I can't believe how strong and courageous and, and I just, I, I feel sad for them that they didn't get to have the career that they deserved, which was a career that they were able to be themselves. And, and I give them so much credit because I'm hopeful now as more come out and speak uh, about the difficulties of being um, in the LGBTQ community and and trying to be in these environments that haven't been accepting of that in the past. Like, you know, Robbie Rogers and others, I just, man, like, I, I, I'm so grateful for them because without people that have that courage, you know, how do we, how do we change these things? So, man, what a great person to highlight. And, uh, we got to get him. We got We all got to get out and play again soon. That's for sure. Cause he was, a, he was a wonderful player. Yeah. As long as he's on my team, uh, I'm totally cool with that. Why well, Kyle, you get the- <laughs> <laughs> well, Kyle, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been awesome and make sure everybody you follow him in, on Instagram at Kyle Martino. Uh, you can keep up with all of his hair changes and with anything else uh, that he's doing and make sure you go to NBC sports to catch up on all the stuff he's going to be doing on TV. I know you've got a marathon schedule ahead of you, Kyle. So we wish you the best of luck and hopefully you'll uh, get some proper rest along the way. It was great talking with you, man. So good to see you, brother. You too, Kyle. Thank you again. Peace. All right. Kyle Martino, everyone. An absolute beast. What an interview that was. Whew. That was fun. I feel like we we touched everything, no? I mean, we, we got into the Premier League. We got into Kyle. We talked about mental health, which, which, which I think is super, super important. And I shared that story with you guys. I don't know if I've shared it with you before, but... I have dealt with some bouts of depression and, and not knowing who to talk to and not know who to, to com- confide in. Because you like even with, with regard to the Robbie Rogers thing, you just and David Testo, who he mentioned David Testo. Uh, he was my teammate in Kansas City. He was trying out for a while. We didn't know that he was gay at the time, but he we found out a little bit later when he had moved and signed with a different team. Um, didn't change anything. I think the locker room would have been very supportive. But, but again, I could, I could see the fear there. And so it's hard to know who to trust with some of these things, some things that you're holding very close uh, to your heart and, and keeping those, clar- those cards close. So, um, yeah, that was great. It was a great interview. Uh, make sure you guys follow Kyle Martino. Uh, he's, he's awesome. And obviously he's doing a lot of things off the field, off camera, that are trying to make a difference for the game in this country in particular. Now, he did run for U.S. soccer president. I could have asked him a thousand questions with regard to that alone because I'm very passionate about growing the game here and, and – creating a, a development system that really is a player first and not about making money first. Now, I think there's a balance. I know that people have to make money, right? You got to pay the coaches. You got to rent the fields. You got to do all that stuff. Like it takes money to, to get some of that going, but it feels like we're making, trying to make more money as opposed to the player development. And I think there's a nice middle ground. And I hope with this new MLS youth development Academy, we can start to find all that, but you know what time it is, everyone. You know what time it is? Well, first and foremost, if you're just joining us, we're going to do a watch along Manchester City versus Arsenal tomorrow. It's going to be me, Mike Kay, uh, John Hudson, and Monty Rossetti. And I might sub one of those guys out and bring on somebody that subscribes to this channel. You're going to join the watch along. We're going to be doing that a lot, trying to find all different types of perks for you guys uh, that sub and, and, uh, and follow and all that good stuff. So much appreciated, everybody that subs and anybody that's new. Uh, stick around. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then on Friday, we're working on the special guests. Uh, I think it's one of the cooligans, if you guys are familiar with them. Maybe Christian, maybe Alexis. We can do a coin flip and see which one comes on. And then we're going to do a watch along for Spurs versus Manchester United. So a lot of big things coming up on this channel. But before uh, those things start and before this ends, we got to sh- we got to shred. We got to shred for the subs. Get out those. Get out the emotes. We're going to get some new emotes, by the way. Don't you worry. We're going to really enhance this. This is just just the beginning of what I think can be a very special show. We already think it's fun, but we want to continue to make it better and better. Get those emotes out. The guitars, the red guitars. It's time to shred. There they are. Oh, wait. Hold on. Hold on a second. I forgot to shred it up. Here it is. Yeah, let's go.
awesome. Woo. Anyway, how are you guys? Troy, what's up? I know, remember when the bolt... This is a fun fact for you guys. This is uh, Power Hour After Dark here. I remember when the bolt would fall every single time when I shredded. But you know what? I picked up my game and I nailed it in the wall. Yeah. Del Piero is better than Pirlo? All right, we got to end the stream on that. Dan Davenport has ended the stream by saying that Del Piero is better than Pirlo. We can't have that. All right, guys, we'll see you tomorrow. We're going to probably start 30 minutes early, do a little preview. Manchester City versus Arsenal. Come and join us. I think the game kicks off at 12 Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. You guys know when it's kicking off. We'll see you then. Thank you to everybody behind the scenes that make me look so much better than I deserve to look. Mike K, John Hudson, Monty Rossetti, Chike Nwoye. It's all happening. Tyler Larson definitely needs a shout out as well. And yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for hanging out today. Thank you again to Kyle Martino. Deuces! Once I find the right button. Actually, you know what? I got this for you. Watch this first. Again, as Bruce alluded to before, I think Conrad Bolkenegger is definitely a guy that has to be a major target on this play. Number four for the United States. Lennon sends it in. The header, and that's out of the back of the net. The United States strikes, and it's Jimmy Conrad. Jimmy Conrad finds the net. One to nothing, USA. Jimmy Conrad, a late bloomer. He'll be 30 next Monday. Dig it out of your net, Osvaldo Sanchez. Dig it out of your net. How's that nest, nest, net, 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 net taste? All right, guys, see you tomorrow. Peace out.